Hello, everybody. This is Lawrence Lesser, the creator and artistic director of the First Monday series at Jordan Hall at New England Conservatory. This is a very strange situation we're in right now. Absolutely never happened anything like this, and we hope that it will soon be a fading memory. Jordan Hall is the place where when I was president back in 1985, I started this series as a chance for colleagues from the faculty and wonderful alums to come together to play essentially different, all different kinds of chamber music, small ensembles, um, for your pleasure. But it wasn't just your pleasure, it was our pleasure as well, because with a great hall at a great institution and a great audience, it's the perfect combination of things. Well, the last time, I mean, the concerts are October, November, December, March, April, May. The last time I was talking to you live was at the December concert. March, I meant to, but there was a death in my family and I wasn't here for that, and we all know what happened after that. So what happened after that was going to be a big celebration of Beethoven, which all the arts organizations are doing now. And I had planned two, I think, very, very interesting programs, not just all Beethoven primarily, but having to do with interactions with people in his circle. Last season was a season that was dedicated to the concept of friendship. Beethoven had lots of friends, but he was not an easy person to have as a friend, particularly in his later years. But he was very, very hopeful and when he's, when, as a young man. And uh, what I can tell you is that in this concert, the October concert and the December concert coming up, I've managed to rescue, for the most part, the concerts from last April and May. Here and there, an artist was not available, but the idea of the concerts a little bit reshuffled is nonetheless there. Trying to figure out the world of Beethoven, how he worked and who influenced him and whom he liked, how he survived, lots of those things will come up. So this fall we have those two programs in October and December. And we've got a very special program that is almost completely settled right now for November. I think I don't have to remind you that November 2nd is the night before the election. And we're working on a program that I call America. I think it's the right thing to do that time. Okay, that's enough of my general comments. I am right now sitting in my teaching studio upstairs from Jordan Hall a place I love being and where I can't be all the time these days because of what we're all going through. So in that spirit that things are coming to you pre-recorded or online, um, first Monday we'll have no live audience this year. And everything we show you, as much recorded in Jordan Hall as possible, but without exception, pre-recorded. We'll assemble the programs and they will come to you just as if you were in your seat in Jordan Hall at 7.30 in the evening of the first Monday of a month. So here we go. Our program this, that for that evening is going to have three pieces on it. One by Beethoven, one by Mozart, and another one by Beethoven. So let's start at the beginning. Beethoven was born in Bonn in 18, excuse me, 1770. I'm off for a hundred years, that's a lot. And he was a very gifted young fellow. And as he grew up, by the time he was a teenager, he was very noticed for his talent, which was remarkable as a pianist, as an improviser, as a creative spirit. More than anything else we read, he wanted to go to Vienna where his god, Mozart, was. And in fact, he got there when he was 16 or 17 years old. 16, I guess it must have been. It was 1787, so he was not yet 17. 
He was in Vienna for maybe three weeks. Uh, there are stories that he met Mozart, but nobody has proof of it. But the idea of it is that he came because of Mozart, and he didn't stay longer at that time because things were not good at home in Bonn. His mother, it turned out, was dying of tuberculosis. His father was an alcoholic. The household was a mess, and he had to go back. But it is almost certain that while he was there, he heard Mozart play. And it is not certain, but it's worth talking about, that while he was there, he met Mozart and played for Mozart. We have no contemporaneous proof of that, but the story is too good not for, me, for me not to tell you. Um, he came there, and it was in April of 1787, just before he had to quickly go back to Bonn in Germany. Apparently he played, according to a later writer, he played, he auditioned for Mozart and played some kind of a, what he thought was the right flashy kind of piece. Mozart said, okay, but uh, obviously was not showing great enthusiasm. Beethoven was very sensitive. He said, wait, he said, let me improvise something for you. Well, he did. And according to this report, there was somebody in the next room to whom Mozart crept out and said, and I have the quote here, keep your eyes on him. Someday he'll give the world something to talk about. May not have happened, but it should have, <laughs> because all of that happened. By the time, uh, and by that time, and by that, at that moment, Beethoven, um, uh, Mozart was extremely busy because he had just started writing Don Giovanni which was premiered later that year in Prague on October 29th. Well, when Beethoven finally moved back to Vienna in 1792 and settled there, um, he began his life as a composer and as a player. He was highly, highly sought after as an improviser. People wanted to hear him play, and it must have been just staggering what he could do. But he also was writing music. And when you write music, friendship has a lot to do with it. People ask you to do something. At that time, there were a lot of amateur players in Vienna. And somehow or other, he was approached by an oboist, whose name I don't know, to write something. He did write a piece, Opus 87, for two oboes and English horn which was um, published with a high opus number of 87, but it was, it was from that period. And then he decided, you know, um, the finale, it doesn't quite fit to that. I'll write a different finale. Well, what was his finale going to be? Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni, in which there is an aria called La Ci Darem La Mano. Don Giovanni's up to his old tricks. He's trying to seduce Zerlina, and it's a duet between them. And you've heard this many, many times. So what I can say to you, I've said enough, I think, already. This is a set of variations for two oboes in English horn. And in our world of the pandemic, you're going to see those three players sitting, I think, in a triangle shape, 12 feet away from one another, because that's the rule. I think that's all you have to know about that piece. You'll love it. It's just so beautiful. The next piece I want to talk about is about, uh, about is a piece written by Beethoven's god, Mozart. Beethoven, let's see, Mozart came across an instrumentalist who was playing an instrument he'd known about, but he'd never heard anybody play it really well, the clarinet. That was a man in Vienna named Anton Stadler. And he was so taken with Stadler's playing that by the time he was finished, he wrote three masterpieces, the first of which we're going to hear in this concert. It's trio and E-flat major for viola, which Mozart loved to play, clarinet, and piano. And the other two pieces, by the way, are the great 
clarinet quintet for string quartet with clarinet that everybody knows, and finally, the concerto by, uh, played by Statler. All of these were written for this great player. Well, how did it happen? What happened was that uh, Mozart, who had a lot of students, had a student in a, a family called the, the Yakin family. And he decided he was going to write out of friendship a piece for them with Stadler. That piece, by the way, I've read somewhere that it's in E flat major and that for Beethoven, for Mozart, that was the key of friendship. And that's what you're going to hear, this piece. Um, and it was first played in, uh, let's see, what do my notes say here? In August of 1786. And the Kerschel number is right, 498. That's from about that period. And who was playing it? Well, Anton Stadler, of course. I've already given you the hint. The viola was played by Mozart. He loved playing viola. And who was the pianist? His student, Francesca von Jakin, 17 years old. Now that's a form that nobody had ever used before, that combination, but it became more popular in the 19th century when, when Robert Schumann wrote romances for that and in the early 20th century, much later, when and, um, the composer Bruch wrote more pieces for that combination. So without further ado, let's just go now and listen to some music. Here we go, two pieces from that early period, from the early part of Beethoven's career, from the late part of Mozart's career. Sit back and enjoy it.
Well, you've just heard what ordinarily would be the first half of our program, and so I hope if you stop watching for a little while, you can go to the fridge and get a drink, have a snack, and come down and settle down for one of the greatest pieces of chamber music ever written. We're now turning to his last piano trio, known as the Archduke Trio, in B-flat major, opus 97. And it is a magnificent piece on broad scale, and it's just about at the end of what we call his middle period. It is by this time that he is totally deaf. 1802, he wrote a will in a suburb of Heiligenstadt, where he was living. And, and this piece is later, it's 18, um, 1811. Um, so he knew he was losing his hearing, and he was essentially saying, how could it happen to me of all people? I for whom sound is my life. And by the time he finishes writing, he says, but I am determined, I will go forward. And this document was not found until many years after his death. But it's kind of an insight into the force of this man's creativity. He was nothing going to stop him. He was going to go forward uh, as we are in the middle of the pandemic. We are going to bring music to you for ourselves, for you, for humanity. Well, it's called the Archduke Trio because there was somebody who became his student named Archduke Rudolf. Rudolf was the youngest child of 12 of the Emperor Leopold II of Austria. And his mother, Leopold's wife, was Maria Luisa of Spain. Interesting. Okay. As the twelfth child, it was not likely that he would ever become emperor, but he was definitely more nobility. And he went to study with Beethoven around 1803 when he was maybe 15 years old, something like that. And they formed a very close relationship. Of course, Beethoven always calling him your majesty, your excellency, whatever. A little bit strange, but that was the relationship. That was the way you did it in those days. And this last period of the middle, middle part of Beethoven's life is just amazing with the strain, with the stream of new pieces that came out. And in all of this period and going even into the late period, there are at least a dozen pieces that he dedicated to Archduke Rudolf. Before I talk about the piece, I'm going to tell you about some of them. Fourth and fifth piano concertos. The Sonata Les Adieux, 81A. The String Quartet, the Serioso, 95. Opus 96, the last violin sonata. Opus 97, what we're playing in this program. Opus 98, Antiferne Geliebte, a song cycle to the distant beloved, about which one can talk endlessly because nobody really knows for sure who that was. We do know that all of his life, Beethoven wanted more than anything to have a wife, a family, a settled, stable, and as often as he tried, it never clicked. But anyway, okay, and then 97 is what I've told about. Okay, then we skip a little bit to Opus 106. Anybody remember what that is? It's the Hammerklavier Sonata, also to Archduke Rudolf. Anybody ever hear of the Missus Solemnis? Also dedicated to Archduke Rudolf. Anybody ever hear of the Große Fuge? also dedicated to him. Well, that was a really important relationship. And of course, it involved money. But it was more than that. Beethoven got a lot of money support from this prince, this archduke, 
who later on, by the way, later on became a cardinal. And anyway, so I want to tell you a little bit about the piece, just a little bit, because it's so well known, I don't really have to go into great details. It's in the grand style. It's written with spacious melodic lines. One of the great features of Beethoven's music is the subito dynamics, the sudden louds, the sudden softs. In rehearsing this piece over the last period of time, I can't say that there is in this piece more of that than any other piece, but it's there from the very beginning in. Uh, sudden fortes, sudden screams, accents, and then pulling away, back and forth. And all four movements have this characteristic. So it starts with a very majestic broad theme and has a playful second theme and great developments all and just magnificent movement. You'd say, that movement is, by the way, is enough to keep, make my stomach full. You know, I don't, I'm not hungry anymore, but then there's more to come. Because the next thing he does is a scherzo that is just fun, except for the middle part, which is spooky. And then grandiose. All of these things are there. It's just he's in full control of his expressive powers and feeling strong and capable. And what follows that is a slow movement of amazing depth tenderness, a set of variations, as Beethoven did so well, which is abruptly stopped by a rousing, rowdy finale, which is nothing other than, let's have a good time. And that's the way the piece is built. There's not much more for me to tell you about that. Just listen well. And the last thing I want to say is, when I finish recording now, I'm going downstairs, when I finish these remarks, when I go downstairs, I'm going to join my colleagues on the stage of Jordan Hall to record the Archduke. I may have said all of these are being recorded in advance of the actual streaming, which will be the normal time, October 5th, 7.30 in the evening. And we've had a lot of discussions about protocol. We know that we have to be careful because of the pandemic. We are socially distanced from one another. That means not closer than six feet apart from one another. It's a little bit less cozy than normally when we play all bunched together right here near the piano, but we're doing that. Then the question was about masks. Now I assure you what I'm about to tell you is in no way a political statement. It's likely I'll know when you'll, we'll all know when you see it because we haven't recorded it yet. We won't be wearing masks. It's my fault. I don't have great eyes and whenever I wear a mask, my glasses get completely clouded up. Maybe some of you have had that problem. And I don't think I can play with it. I have to see the music, have to. So there you are. I've told you what I could. There's only one thing left to do. Let's listen to the music. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 